Hi, it's Jack Joseph Quig. I see here we have a question from Chefo Hernandez. How can you achieve maximum loudness on your mix using just plugins? Um, well, it's interesting. That sort of implies that the best way you get loudness is in analog. Uh, and some ways that's true, some ways it's not true. That's a longer discussion. But in terms of the analog portion, of course, with transformers, when you push the sound real hard, you sort of kill the peaks and therefore you're able to get more level without the digital going into the red for the obvious reasons. Uh, the plug-in loudness situation, there's a tremendous amount of plugins uh, that you can use to achieve that, right? So L3, L1, for instance, are two real good examples. What ends up happening uh, is, you know, the louder you push it, the harder you have that compressed, the less peak information you have. So really, what we're talking about is a relationship between peak in information, the relationship between peak information and the relationship between RMS, the average level. Uh, so the whole thing with the plugins or even in analog domain is a matter of actually killing some of those peaks, or we can call them transients and therefore you're able to have more room to lift the level up and get more of the RMS level. Of course, when you kill the transients, that's when things start to sound not as attacky, not as aggressive, and can sound flat. You hear, hear people say, it sounds flat, it's too compressed. Part of that is because you've killed the transients. So it's a real trade-off. Uh, the obsession with the level uh, can also be what can kill a great mix. Uh, obviously, we're all in some ways obsessed with the level because whether we like it or not, the client who's massively educated or not will compare it to something else that's loud and ask you why it's not loud. So I understand the pain point of wanting to, to make it louder. And my suggestion again is just use the compressors, even if it's a couple you put together and it could be two compressors you put together to try to control the pink information versus the RMS. If you look at the meters on the Pro Tools, you'll be able to see exactly what you're doing. You'll see a lot more greens than reds. And the perfect world, so to speak, as an example, I say perfect world in, as an example, if you had just all greens, that would be louder than you can imagine. If you have the reds going along with the greens, well, you've got pink information. It's not gonna be as loud, but it's gonna have attack and it's gonna breathe. Looks like Daryl Swart. Hopefully I've pronounced that properly. If not, please excuse me. Uh, how do you deal with the hi-hat bleed when needing to boost high end on snare, but short gate takes away from snare tone? Uh, snare tone, of course, goes away with the short gate because you're taking the length of the note away and that's where the tone resides, right? So if the snare is real tightly gated, you only have the tick left, so therefore there's no tone. What I do uh, is I go ahead and take care of that high bleed by gating tightly. And I either get the tone from one of two places, the obvious one, samples that I stick in, uh, or I side chain the snare, or I should say actually a better way to put it really is to take the, take the snare and duplicate it, so it's identical, right? And add a tremendous amount of bottom, almost so much bottom it could be as much as 10 or 12 at somewhere between 100 and 250 hertz, anywhere in there. And I would put like a stupid amount of that little bottom in, where if you were living, listen to it by itself, you'd be like, uh, that's absolutely useless. And why is a snare drum like a bass drum, right? But if you sneak that underneath the other one, where now you've got the attack because you've gated it very tightly, and now you're adding that little bottom in there, it starts to feel like there's a lot of low end because of course that you're EQing so much bottom, you're not lifting up the hi-hat level. Of course, you gotta be careful between the bass drum and that new channel I just described because now the phase relationship between those two really matter. So make sure the phase is not an issue with your adding so much bottom on the snare that's canceling the bass drum. So be very careful, check that phase. But again, at all that low bottom, the ear will think that you've added tone because it'll hear the length to the note. The cue on the equalizer 
The frequency choice is very important so it doesn't sound too tubby, right? And it's not too broadened where it sounds sloppy and loose. You want it to be tight. It is the backbeat. So unfortunately, you have to use your ears. Your ears are the best tool you can ever have when you're making decisions like that. Does your choice of monitors really matter or is it on how comfortable and how you adapted you are to your monitors? If so, what's your favorite monitor? Speakers are like headphones, like a t-shirt, like a shirt, like earmuffs. It's what you feel comfortable with and what you connect with. And I've had people make amazing records that I've mixed that I was very impressed with the tonality and the EQ scape of what they did. I wanted to find out that they maybe did it on a pair of speakers that I would never even consider using, or maybe I even dislike. Um, so I get asked this question all the time from <clears throat> actually regular people as well as you know very well educated people. And I honestly have to say that you just gotta listen to different speakers and find the one that fits your ear. You know, maybe you have ears very sensitive to brightness. So obviously you don't want something that's real bright and vice versa, you know, whatever the situation might be. I, you know, the Genelec 1032s I use a lot. I'm very comfortable with those, always have been. Uh, NS10s, of course, we all use, it's standard. At least at this point, it's almost going, but still kind of a standard. Uh, and after that, it's different kinds of speakers I've used over the years. I've used KRK, I've used JBLs. You know, I've used all kinds of stuff. My philosophy is you should be able to make it on anything. And with a quick listen, you can put up iTunes and just go down 15, 20 songs, get a feel for how those speakers work, and then maybe play a few things that you really know well that you're comfortable with, that you know actually what they sound like, and adjust your ears. And of course, test pilot. Take a few mixes, make a few balances. Don't spend a lot of time, just kind of do it quick and f listen to it and listen to it and see what it feels like in a few other different places. Looks like Rama. Uh, how do you make vocal sounds so smooth and airy at the same time? Total function of mid-range. Uh, very, very, very high level skill set. The attitude and the character and the mood of instruments reside in the mid-range. They do not live in the high end. They do not live in the way, way, way extreme low end. They live in the mid-range. That is where you hear the crack in the voice, the ring in the snare, the rattle in the guitar string, the pick against acoustic guitar strings, the finger on the guitar strings, rattle on the bass. It all lives in that mid-range. The piano, C3, middle A, all of that, excuse me, middle C, all that is right in the mid-range. And that's where the character resides. So, if you scoop some of the mid-range out, you can sometimes get a voice that might be a little too mid rangey or you can, and that's dangerous again, because that's very important. In some ways, it's almost a no-no, so you gotta be very, very careful. I kind of wish in some ways I didn't say that because I don't want people to go crazy with the mid-range. Um, what I've done a lot of times is used uh, compressors uh, that have allocated EQ within them, right? So uh, a C1 would be an example. Uh, there's lots of different ones like that. Uh, and I can sometimes just have the compressor carefully on peaks dip out that mid-range, which allows the top and the bottom to sound louder compared to the mid-range on those notes where it might be a little too shrieking. The first thing I discussed, of course, would be more just a sort of overall EQ. Maybe it was recorded on a microphone that kind of pushed the mid-range, or the room was a little too mid-rangey, or the console is adding a, a, a mid-range, or Pro Tools is adding a mid-range you don't like. Then you can go through and carefully soundscape it, but be very careful. If you take too much of that mid-range out, uh, I mean, you've got to be dainty. If you take too much of that mid-range out, the vocal won't sound like it's really pushing out the attitude it needs to. It'll sound you know, too smooth and too airy. So it's very dangerous. The, the top end, when it says airy, generally a function, once you get the mid-range right, Definitely a function of EQ. There's a lots of equalizers that you can add 15, 20K stuff to get that air. Um, but then you get into a sibilant issue. So it becomes a very high skilled technique, frankly, of finding the right DSing that's not allowing the high end to be too much, but the air is kind of open up the top, but then getting the mid range carved out and making sure there's not too much bottom that's making you perceive that it's not airy. 
but the low mid range uh, you want to be very careful with as well. You know, anywhere from, in my opinion, from 250 to 2K, very dangerous area. You got to make sure that you don't roll out too much at lower bottom so you don't lose the chest so that when you put the vocal in the record that is competing, the bass toms, all these different things that live in those areas are not, you're not, you've carved it out so much that now the vocal sounds kind of thin and unsupported. So sometimes those judgments you got to make once you've, once you've you know really focused in and you've made those changes and you got to kind of focus back out and go like well what does it feel like in the record did i go too far or not far enough mr taylor uh, what's the process you use to create full warm buttery vocals that seem to surround you uh, well i think we kind of touched a little bit on that with this last question the full warm of course is that lower mid-range area and the buttery has to do with the function of the mid-range versus the top end and the surround you then comes into different chorusing that you can use, uh, different delays you can use, different reverbs you can use. You know, a short reverb can be very disguisey to make something feel like it's kind of buttery and warm. And by the way, you can EQ all those things on the return, right? So it doesn't mean you have to send something real warm. You can send something that's been carved out the way you want it to. And then on the return, add some lower middle or, or bottom that makes you feel like it feels buttery and warm. And, Cut out the mid-range a little farther because it is the return on that chorus or that delay. Uh, that usually kind of works very well for me. Sebastian, where do you think the future of music industry is going? Good or bad place? Um, obviously, an extremely long discussion. Not, not one minute answer. Uh, so I think the simplest answer I can give you is obviously we now are part are now living in the digital revolution and it's been an absolute uh, renaissance in terms of how people consume music listen to music buy music and you know obviously the the YouTube component has got a lot of people listening to it because they want the visual as well as the audio audio um, but I think that as some of the smarter business brains start to come into our business and they start to realize that there's that there's the potential to make money and those kind of minds help harness the digital revenue that is possible. The truth is we could end up with more money than we know what to do with. We're just not there yet. We're in that place where we've moved from an analog world and we're moving into a digital world and not everybody knows exactly how to harness that, how to deal with the finance of, of what it could be. But imagine a world where all the digital domains start to have to pay a price or a tax or people's consciousness start to understand that just taking something is not cool and they need to like either subscribe to a subscription based uh, listening music or another, whether it's Amazon, iTunes, where they pay for it. You know, if that all starts to become part of the consciousness of pop culture and digital starts to get its uh, ability to have like a toll bridge, for lack of a better description, we'll call it, we would know what to do with the money. So that's my hope. Jesse, do you mix with EQ compression or other processing on the two best? If so, which units plugin do you tend to use? Thanks. Well, obviously, I definitely use compression on stereo bus and EQ. Compression for me is not level. It never has been, and I've said this a million times in a million different places. I'm sure some of you that maybe have come across something of mine probably have read it or seen it at a nauseum. But I think that's because I hate the fact that a lot of people view compression as just getting it up loud. Compression, as I've said a million times, is the most musical piece of equipment we get to work with. It's the only thing that changes time. It has an actual time constant component where I can make something feel late and early and move around and wheeze and have a, a life that feels like it's air, air, that have a life where it feels like it's moving in a beautiful way. So. That's what I do with my compression and stereo bus, is I try to find something uh, that is making the mix, you know, breathe and move and not feel one dimensional, but multiple dimensions to it because it's feeling like it's coming and going. I've tried everything on a stereo bus. I've tried every plugin, every analog hardware piece you could imagine. Literally everything you could ever imagine, I've tried it. And I find myself you know, obviously lots of times I'm going back to the standards, you know, the SSL obviously gets used a tremendous amount and some of the Neves get used a tremendous amount. 
uh, but the plugins in the computer in, in Pro Tools, that particular DAW, um, I think a lot of, I think the you know, L1 and the L3, 316, I mean, there's a bunch of them that really sound cool. UA has a couple things that are great. Uh, you just have to just try it. I, I honestly, there's to me no go-to. If you want to go-to, I'm just going to say use a SSL. Go-to. That'll work. Kind of never let you down. But I don't know that that's always the best creative choice. It's the safe choice. It's going to work. Probably 80% of the records have it on it, but not necessarily the creative choice. And I'm always really liking to choose and try to find something creative because that's just how I hear things. And then the EQ, of course, is, is your choice again. I like the EQ after the compression, probably eight out of 10 times. I don't like pushing the EQ into the compression unless I want that kind of a, an effect. And I don't want to necessarily lose the EQ curve I'm adding because the compressor obviously is gonna react to those frequencies that I'm pushing or taking out. EQ on the bus, you have to find something that you like. Without a shadow of a doubt, uh, all the plugins have a sound. So you're identifying not just the sonic curve, but you're also identifying the EQ choice in terms of how it sounds. You know, obviously, in my, this is my personal opinion, you know, for instance, like a Focusrite would have a certain sound. I'm talking about the Focusrite plugin. Uh, or you could try the, a model 1073, that would have a sound. You could throw in an SSL channel strip, that would have a sound. Without doing anything, just going through it, it's gonna have a sound. And you have to listen to it, you know, is this record real acoustic and beautiful? Maybe I want something like a Neve modeling. Maybe I want a couple Puig techs, you know, that are very soft and pretty and beautiful. Maybe I open up the band real far and open the 15K, the bandwidth, and, you know, really open it up, make it sound beautiful. Or maybe it's a rock record where I want to be more aggressive. You know, I might use an SSL channel strip, go for the 3K, the 7K that really pushes the record out hardcore. You really got to use your ears. You know, what's difficult over the years is constantly trying to convince people that there's not a go-to. And experimentation is your best friend. The next question is from Martin Messi. You are known for using a lot of vintage analog gear and using a lot of it for parallel compression and or other types of parallel treatment. If you have worked in Pro Tools with plugins, can you share with us some of your choices of plugins and their uses? Uh, I've been working in Pro Tools extremely, ex extremely accessibly in the last six years uh, and in the last two years, a tremendous amount. And I'd actually say more in Pro Tools than in analog. And analog, of course, is fantastic. I love all my plugins. I love all my analog gear. Uh, I still think that most of us, not all of us, but most of us are still doing a hybrid between the two. We're not totally ready to let go of the full amount of the analog because there's things that it does that digital hasn't got to yet. Uh, the modeling, the digital world, of course, is getting better, 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 and better, and better. In some cases, I think it's really like fantastic and as usable as a hardware piece. In some cases, they didn't get it. So, and of course, is the cases where they didn't get it, I wouldn't use it, and that's obvious. Um, different types of plugins, it says here, that you can share on some of your choice, trace some, uh, so I guess you want me to share some of my choice of plugins and their uses. I, uh, hmm. One of my favorite plugins is Audio Tracks. Uh, it's one of those compressors that really, like a Fairchild, wheezes and moves in a way I really like. You know, it's got a life to it. And uh, I think it's great on overheads. I've had it great on room mics, sometimes on bass. Not too much, too much success uh, with guitar. Uh, some of the EMI stuff is really great for guitar in terms of compression and even the EMI EQ stuff is really pretty stunning uh, for guitar. Vocals, I find myself using a lot of the Puig Child and obviously not because I designed it and it's not my piece. It, I've always liked Fairchild, period. So uh, I'm very comfortable with uh, saying publicly that I think it's an incredible close rendition in some ways better than even the analog piece. And I've had maybe 35 Fairchilds underneath my hands over the years. It's excellent. 
Um, you'll find lots of times you can just put on the vocal, turn it on, you don't, don't even have to do anything, and it sounds amazing. Um, so those are a few ideas. I guess we could sit here really, to be honest, we could go through hours and hours of it. It's a weird thing, this question, because I find when people ask me, what's your favorite record or favorite artist? I always go kind of get stuck. Because when I think about it, it's like, uh, I don't know, what's my favorite artist, what's my favorite record? Like, I have lots of things I like. I feel like about the plugins, you know, probably if we were a little more relaxed and had a little more time and start talking between the two of us, for instance, I would start sharing like, oh, what about this plugin, what about that plugin? But those are some real quick ideas. Josh, do you work to set deadlines? Do you set a date, time, and finish the mix when that time comes? Do you find this effective way of keeping objectivity over the mix? And if not, what strategies do you use? Uh, another fairly in-depth question, a lot of different ways to answer it. Uh, I'll say this, art, uh, if we look at records as art, it's never finished. It, it, we could spend days tweaking, changing things and never be 100% happy or always feel like we could make something better. So with art, just one day, or the record we'll call it, one day it just stops. You just finish. You finish because there's no money. You finish because there's a deadline. You finish for whatever reason. People are tired of it. Whatever it is, you finish. Uh, so I think setting a date and a time to finish is important. I think it's really good for arrangements for, pr for production, for recording, for mixing. All of us as artistic people can just keep going on and on and, and, and really getting different perspectives. And, and of course we can pass it up, but lots of times we can make it a lot better. At least I like to think that. And um, keeping the objectivity of the mix is really keeping a close pulse and look at yourself as you're working when you start to become tired of it or you feel like you're on a rescue mission or you feel like you gotta do different things because it's not feeding you, probably time to stop. Work on another song. Work on another three songs. Come back. Come back the next day. Quit. Go have coffee. Get on the phone. Whatever it is, get your mind off it and come back to it. That will give you objectivity without a shadow of doubt. Even listening to some other mixes, listening to some other music. Just something to get your mind off of the insane focus you have sometimes when you're mixing a song. And since you're, if not, what strategies do you use? I kind of just covered that. So that would be my answer to you, Josh. When she says she loves me.